After years of campaigning by the community, and hard work from the people at Moyang, we now have both parts of the Caves and Cliffs update. Although its development cycle has been rocky to say the least, the two parts together deliver the biggest update Minecraft has ever seen. But did it achieve its goals? How does it compare to the ideas outlined in my video on the cave update? I've been playing in the snapshots and on a lightly modded 1.18 SMP, some of which I streamed, so now I think I've got some answers to these. My name is Cameron, this is Minecraft Ideas Academy, and let's get critiquing. Of course, it wasn't just a cave update. The winner of the 2019 biome vote, The Mountains, came to the game in spectacular fashion. It had a much bigger scope than the previous winner, The Tiger from 2018, which introduced campfires, foxes, and sweetberries. The Mountains ended up with goats, a mob with a unique behavior and personality, able to jump great heights and ram a player or mob that hasn't moved for a while. Goats are also planned to drop their horns, but not on death. Instead, they'll need to be baited into ramming a block. This continues the trend of mobs being useful while alive. Foxes having trust mechanics, dolphins grace, turtles shedding scoots when they grow up, these all result in more interesting interactions. Goat horns haven't been officially implemented yet, only being in the experimental features in Bedrock Edition, but currently they can be blown to make a pillager raid sound. According to Ulraf, a gameplay developer at Mojang, this isn't all that's planned for them. Perhaps horns could scare mobs away, making them useful if you're being swarmed at night. Snowier Snow got added as Powder Snow, which is no joke, I've lost two horses to it so far, and almost died myself. Leather Armor now has a pretty decent use since it prevents freezing, which makes up for it being somewhat situational. Powder Snow definitely makes mountains more engaging to climb, especially given how the texture is extremely similar to regular snow. But if the player has had enough, they could always wear some leather boots to prevent sinking into them. Buckets of Powder Snow are also useful in the nether, they can be placed to extinguish a player on fire, being consumed in the process, which is much less contrived than placing down a cauldron and filling it with water. Although I do wish the freezing was a little more distinguished from fire damage. For example, the player could stop freezing while sprinting, as if trying to warm up their body. Best of all, the new mountain generation was implemented. The addition of six new mountain types, along with the increase to world height, resulted in terrain extremely similar to the biomvert visuals. Finally, the Buzzy Bees trailer is real. In some cases, the snow clashes with the dirt, however, creating ugly looking bands. Apart from that, not only are they beautiful, but they're also easy to climb, with staircasing naturally built into the generation. That's something a lot of previous world generation mods and data packs have neglected, as they generally prefer to focus on aesthetics. When I see a mountain in the distance, I want to climb it for the sheer novelty. That might fade as we get used to the update, but there's no denying they stand out. So what did Mo Yang do? They revamped the rest of the surface, of course. Through experimental snapshots for community feedback, Mojang managed to overhaul so much of the game that the changes alone almost make it feel more like a sequel than an update. The major change is that biomes no longer determine the terrain. Instead, it's all controlled by different randomly generated values that vary across space. Terrain is determined by continentalness, erosion and weirdness, and biomes are additionally determined by temperature and humidity. Throw aquifers and caves into the mix, and you have an inconceivably huge amount of variation based on how these values influence and interact with each other. In the Minecraft Ideas Academy Discord server, linked in the description, we maintained a separate thread dedicated to screenshots of cool looking terrain, and it has been active for months. There's always something new to find. Similarly to the mountains, traversability was kept in mind. For example, rivers are more connected, making them more feasible as travel routes. Golden carrots and apples are now able to lure horses to ease the burden of bringing them across wider rivers. Plus, they even removed those annoying tiny lakes. Some changes weren't kept from the snapshots though, like the changes to elytra boosting, but it's great to see changes like these being trialled with the community first. In an interview with the Washington Post, game director Agnes Larson emphasised the idea of intrinsic motivation, which is when players want to do things for their own sake. I've been live streaming the 1.18 snapshots almost weekly, and the new terrain has made exploring much more fun again. I used to treat exploring like a chore, something that is boring but necessary to reach points of interest like a village or a stronghold. But recently, I've noticed myself wanting to explore for the fun of it. The cool formations I see along the way leave a trail of breadcrumbs, keeping me fascinated on the journey. Sometimes I even get the urge to build on them, even if I don't plan to keep the world long term. In one of my worlds, I built my base on a small floating island, and added some dripstone to it simply for novelty. This focus on intrinsic motivation is something that sets Minecraft apart from many other games, and it's great to see it receive a bit of the spotlight. Old worlds were kept in mind for this update too, 
World blending was added to make the transition between the old and new terrain less jarring. Previously with terrain or biome changes, landscapes would be cut off. This system could also be reused if any other big world generation changes are made. I don't have any long term worlds to upgrade myself, but from what I've seen it works very effectively. It is much harder to tell exactly where the terrain switches over. There's a lot of variation in the new caves too. Along with the existing cave carvers, which create dead ends, we have three new types of caves, spaghetti, noodle, and cheese. Cheese caves resemble the holes in Swiss cheese, creating wide open spaces. Spaghetti caves create narrow wiggly spaces, and noodle caves result in even more cramped spaces. These cave types all intersect with one another, creating systems that are far more interesting to traverse. Caving is one of my favourite activities in Minecraft. I love spending hours mining out all the ores, placing torches on the left side of the cave wall so I can find my way back, and blocking off dead ends. But these new caves required me to rethink my strategy. Some caves were too big for the wall torches to fully light them up, even with the welcome change of monsters only spawning in complete darkness. There were a lot more cave branches, so I had to create a larger mental map, or come back to them later. I felt like I was being challenged again, like I was levelling up my navigation skills in real life. Glow like and house of lighting up the caves, but I have mistaken it for diamond ore on numerous occasions. Plus I am used to torches being the only form of light, apart from lava, underground, which adds to the difficulty with navigation. The new ore textures are great, not only are they helpful for colourblind people, they also help me to identify ores through my peripheral vision. Plus they look more appetising to mine if that makes any sense. Glow squids also contribute to the ambience, though I often see them beaching themselves. I've heard that's because of its iconicity, but I think it's worth losing that to make them last for a little longer. Glowing sacks are also nice for lighting up signs and item frames. They certainly aren't entirely useless like many people thought. Mine shafts have received a little change to make them fit better in large caverns, hanging from chains or supported by posts, the latter of which is a great source of wood. While I wish mine shafts were properly updated, the new biomes and cave types help keep them fresh for now. Also, totally cool the world height change, and it's definitely noticeable, even before they added deep slate, I hadn't reached the bottom after 2 hours of caving. But once the deep slate was added, it set the mood even without the deep dark. Seeing the Y coordinate go below zero gave an eerie feel, because I knew I was going somewhere that I'd never been before. I can't say for sure, but the deep slate caves seem to be bigger, and as a result spawn more mobs. It certainly feels more dangerous down there, if only because I'm much further away from the surface. The new ore generation also contributes to this feeling, as coal doesn't generate deep down. I used to start off mining every piece of coal I saw, then eventually give up as there was so much. But now I don't give up, because I know I'll end up running out of torches in the deep slate layer. That's an advantage this system has over the biome based one I suggested. Instead of running around on the surface for a biome with more of the ore you want, you can go to a specific depth and start mining there. Gone are the poor taste jokes about strip mining at Y11. Caving and strip mining are also both viable strategies for different reasons. The fact that deep slate is never insta-mineable encourages caving at low altitudes, and the ores that generate with reduced air exposure encourage diving into aquifers once you come back with some water breathing equipment, like the potions that now spawn on buried treasure. Reduced air exposure also helps tuck away ores that a casual player wouldn't need much of, such as lapis lazuli. And copper also generates in dripstone caves, making them a useful place for builders to amass large quantities. Speaking of large, we also have large ore veins, which aim to change up the gameplay of mining itself. You're not just mining the ores, you're mining the blocks mixed up in them, so you can investigate where the vein leads to next. The copper veins contain granite, and the iron veins contain tuff. Plus they also contain raw ore blocks, which are satisfying to come across. A completely excavated vein can give stacks and stacks of iron and copper, which could be a viable alternative for some who currently use iron farms. Plus. Metal ores drop raw items instead of themselves, and the fortune enchantment can be used to get even more, encouraging players to mark a large ore vein and come back to it once they have a pickaxe with fortune. This also adds the opportunity to make metal ores give XP when mined. I know smelting the raw ores already gives XP, but there's something more satisfying about collecting the XP orbs as you mine. On the SMP I'm currently playing on, we have this change enabled, and it definitely encourages me to mine ores I wouldn't normally seek out, like copper. A lot of people were surprised that I correctly predicted copper, but it is a very well known ore, and our implementations were completely different. During development of the cave upgrade mod, whose ideas I featured in that video, I worried a lot about how to prevent copper tarnishing from being griefy. First I had the idea to only make bubble columns tarnish copper, but that ended up taking far too much effort for a player to set up. I ended up reusing the idea for the renewable sand and gravel mechanic in Upgrade Aquatic though. Then I considered making electrified copper blocks tarnish if they are next to water, but that limited trap potential. 
In the end, I decided on copper wire being the only thing tarnishable by water, which could then transfer its tarnish onto a dust item. Then any copper block could be right clicked by the item to transfer the tarnish to it. Mojang's copper blocks simply tarnish over time. However, you can wax blocks with honeycomb to prevent that, and use an axe to revert it. This is far more elegant in my opinion, and I've enjoyed seeing the copper roof of my storeroom change a little every time I come back to my base. It's just a little ironic given the amount of time I spent trying to prevent spontaneous tarnishing. I even sought advice from Corey, a Minecraft gameplay developer, and while I didn't know it, at the time they were developing Vanilla's Copper in preparation for the Caves and Cliffs announcement at Minecraft Live. The bulk of Cave Upgrade's copper ideas though were brainstormed by Nopecopter, a friend of mine. To summarise, copper as a tool tier would be between stone and iron, with iron's durability being buffed to be closer to diamonds. There was also copper wire, which could transmit current to copper blocks, and would give an electric shock when interacted with or touched. Other ideas included copper golems that patrolled a set path, converters to switch between redstone and copper, and statues resembling different mobs that could attract and repel mobs. We also made iron spawn further down, so that the first tier of tools and armour a player makes would be copper. This changed up the gameplay a fair bit, the lack of shields and buckets was heavily felt, but that was short lived once enough iron was obtained. Ultimately, I've come to the conclusion that Minecraft doesn't really need new tool tiers, unless they offer something unique like Netherite does. Minecraft's progression doesn't function like most games. It serves to introduce new opportunities for creativity at the player's own pace, resulting in players setting their own goals instead of being obliged to follow the intended path. Mojang's Copper currently crafts two items. The first is the Lightning Rod, which redirects lightning strikes to prevent flammable builds from burning down, which is a nice way to make lightning a preventable disaster, as Jeb's book outlines, without having adverse effects on lightning's positive capabilities. There's also the handy dandy spyglass, known as the bring him nearer and pirate speak thanks to yours truly. But as I said, ideally a new ore should be as useful as an existing ore with a similar rarity. Copper is even more abundant than iron, which makes sense if you want to amass large amounts of it for building, but for people less interested in building, there isn't much going for it. I've seen that critique quite often. Copper's in-game, or endogenous value, is closer to that of lapis, redstone, or nether quartz. For non-builders and non-redstoners, it has a couple niche uses and makes a trinket. There isn't really a sink for these players, no reason for them to amass large quantities of it. And while I wonder why non-builders would prefer to play Minecraft than a game that might cater better to their tastes, I still can't help agree that copper is somewhat lacking when compared to other ores. Of course, copper can have features added in future updates. The leaked page from Jeb's book on the poisonous potato mentions that releasing a feature and expanding on it later naturally allows for much more creative freedom than aiming for perfection from the onset. Does that sound insightful and profound? Whatever your answer, doesn't matter because I made it up. This page is fake, it's not in the actual Jib book. I got a friend to do the render. It was quite funny though, because I managed to prank a lot of people with it, including Japper, who actually works at Mojang. Anyway, even though stuff can be added in later, does that mean it will be? Sure, Campfire's got extra functionality in Buzzy Bees, Honeycomb now crafts candles and waxes copper in Caves and Cliffs, but there's still a lot of content with significant flaws that are yet to be addressed. For example, the Phantom's intrusiveness, the overpoweredness of villagers, and the grind to obtain a trident. Of course, I don't expect copper to be the next iron, since iron has had 10 years to accumulate uses. But I do wish copper had extra sinks, because unless I want to build with copper, I'm largely going to ignore the ore, which will be frustrating since so much of it spawns. Some people have suggested that iron be swapped for copper in some crafting recipes to give copper more use. However, iron clearly shows in anything crafted from it, so the texture would also need to be changed, potentially ruining the use in existing builds. If I were to give more uses to copper, I would lean into its building potential, such as using them for pipes. This would end up inadvertently decreasing the need for iron, as hoppers are currently a big sink for iron for endgame players, who use them in large amounts to transport items across long distances reliably. However, hoppers also have other functionality, such as collecting dropped items, sorting items, and as redstone circuits. So if pipes were better at item transportation, being cheaper and or faster than hoppers, they could leave hoppers with their other uses. They wouldn't be changed, but one of their functions would be done better by another block. Copper pipes could also transport fluids, or even projectiles, with cartoon physics applying. Other building related uses of copper could be wireframes that outline the shape of a building before the exact blocks are chosen, a light source that can be buried in the ground, eliminating torch spam, or the previously mentioned idea of copper wire. If players are encouraged to build to defend themselves, that could potentially lead to more players engaging with the building mechanics, 
allowing them to better appreciate Minecraft as a sandbox. And of course, copper could get doors, trapdoors, bars, lanterns, walls, ladders, buttons, pressure plates. If its primary purpose is for building, it would ideally have a lot of different blocks to play with. Amethyst has a similar problem. Its usefulness is on par with copper, crafting a spyglass and tinted glass, though it's far less widespread, only being found in geodes. The geodes, however, are lovely. They look pretty, sound pretty, and are much more unique than simply adding crystals to caves. Inspired by Atium from the Mistborn series, Amethyst can only be renewed from budding Amethyst blocks, which cannot be transported in any way, encouraging players to build a path to one, or a base around one. However, to get the most efficient rates, all other blocks must be cleared out of the area so that as many sides of the budding blocks are exposed and can grow amethyst. This results in rather ugly looking farm setups. So what if budding blocks were able to spread? Perhaps they could convert adjacent amethyst blocks, provided they've been treated somehow. Theoretically, this means you could set up a line of treated amethyst leading to your base, but it would take an extraordinarily long time, and at that point your patience should be rewarded. The main thing is that you'd be encouraged to grow and nurture the geode, instead of mining away all the non-budding blocks. Budding blocks could also take longer to mine, so that people don't destroy them on accident. Speaking of destruction, let's talk about mining. There hasn't been much to diversify the act of mining, just the encouragement of alternate methods like moss, which I'll talk about later. I've been working on some though, I'm considering some changes to my momentum mod, which adds an enchantment that speeds up a tool to instamine when mining the same kind of block. Since Deep Slate is supposed to never be instaminable, I might make it so that blocks at least as hard as Deep Slate can't be instamined, but still would be quicker to mine than Efficiency 5 Haste 2. I've also been considering making the momentum reset when a player moves. Sneaking would be allowed though, walking would be allowed with Haste 1, and sprinting would be allowed with Haste 2. Adding that mechanic might allow an easier way to understand when the instamine runs out, because I've received a lot of feedback saying it feels like a bug. And I'm also considering adding a level 2 for momentum so that it can mine through a large ore vein, which consists mostly of two different blocks, without resetting the speed. I'll have to iterate on the exact implementation of all of these however. There hasn't been much change to minecarts either, except for rails being waterloggable. From what my modder friends have told me, minecart code is horrifying. It's almost a decade old, and it shows, with complex logic and legacy code. If the mowing developers were to redo minecarts, they'd need to virtually start from scratch, while also making sure their new code allows for similar possibilities as the old. So I understand why they weren't redone in this update, I just hope that at some point they are revisited. I've also been working on some explosives for the nether extension mod. The first is Boomstone, which I mentioned in my other cave update video. The initial idea was brainstormed by my friend Zim. Boomstone's implementation hasn't changed much, apart from no longer being activated by redstone, to make it a little more distinguished from TNT. My friend Zoe has added a similar block to her mod Scorch, called Pyrak which can also be detonated via fiery projectiles like flaming arrows or gas fireballs. There's also the Sporus, which is the spiritual successor to the Spore Creeper from the Netherrex mod. It's neutral, but when it explodes, it infects nearby mobs, causing baby Sporite to spawn around them. When killed, they drop warp spores, which can be brewed into a potion of infection, or fed to baby Sporite to age them up and also cause the explosion to destroy blocks. These blocks will also drop themselves, as if mined with the Silk Touch tool. This way, the Sporize Destruction can be used as a tool to mine blocks endlessly, given that you're able to maintain your stores of warped spores. The Sporus reminds me of if moss was an entity, since it can be bone mealed to convert nearby stone, making it quicker to mine. And the excess moss can be composted into more bone meal. But wait, I hear you say, doesn't this break the primary principle one block at a time? To answer that, we have to look into why the principle was established. One reason being to maintain Minecraft's interaction model, and another to make it easier for players to collaborate with building. Technically you could say that it's the bone meal spreading the plants and not the player, but that could be used to justify anything that would obviously break that rule. I think it makes sense here, because everyone knows plants grow, so it doesn't make it hard to predict that bone mealing some moss, or just some grass, will spread it. Ultimately, the principles are more like guidelines. Once you understand why they're put in place, you can bend them while still respecting their wisdom. Moss also produces azalea bushes when bone mealed, which is very useful when running low on torches. I can simply kill some skeletons, bone meal some azalea bushes, and get some wood, then smelt some of that for charcoal if need be. A lot of people have suggested azalea would get its own wood type instead of using oak. Personally, I wouldn't mind either way, but I can understand why it uses oak. All wood types are very easy to obtain in large quantities, but azalea trees only naturally spawn as indicators to lush caves, a clever method of leading the player so you'd need to plant your own forest in order to build a lot with azalea wood. 
Some people would do that of course, but not many, making an Azalea Wood set's gameplay value far less than the other ones. Let's follow that rooted dirt under the Azalea tree into a lush cave. They're not exactly a safe haven, but they're a nice place to settle for a while and renew your supplies. The terrain of lush caves is a little tricky to navigate, they almost feel like far more forgiving basalt deltas. The drip leaf, which you can only stand on for a certain time, is fun to play around with, but it would be cool if it generated more intentionally, such as in staircases, so that players could hop across them to access hard to reach parts. Glowberries are great for emergency food, as long as they light up the place afterwards. Lush caves are also a wonderful source of clay, something which the game has needed for a while. Clay used to be so scarce that a mod pack infamously balanced its progression around it. In lush caves you can also find the adorable axolotls, which are intended to be used as a support mob in the ocean. If they take enough damage, they play dead and regenerate, making them, in theory, a lot less vulnerable than a pet wolf. If a player kills a mob an axolotl was already attacking, it can grant them regeneration and remove their mining fatigue, making it apparent that it is designed for beating ocean monuments. However, when I playtested this I found axolotls still died fairly easily, which was heartbreaking to say the least. Also, I had a bucket of tropical fish in my offhand to lead them around, but I kept accidentally placing it. Perhaps they could just be led around with tropical fish, or in some other way. Dripstone caves are cool too. The way spelio themes have been implemented feels a lot more solid than modded ones. The use of planes instead of cuboids makes them look more natural and them being their own stone type prevents inventory clutter, as opposed to every single block type having their own spelio theme. They've got some nice mechanics too. Landing on dripstone stalagmites increases fall damage, meaning you have to watch your step in the biome. Dripstone stalactites can be dislodged by breaking the block they hang from, or from a trident. And since drowned can now spawn in dripstone cave aquifers, this potentially means you can see it happening. Pointed dripstone creating renewable lava is nice, though I personally still prefer my glowing obsidian block. That's gone into nether extension by the way, you can get a beta of it by pledging to the Team Abnormal's Patreon, or by boosting their Discord server. I prefer more unique ways of renewing items, like the way shulkers can now duplicate when hit by a shulker bullet. It encourages you to keep a few around instead of mindlessly killing them all. Getting back to dripstone caves, there's a little less to do in them when compared to lush caves. I think something that could spice it up would be a new mob that crawls along ceilings. At first I thought it should dislodge pointed dripstone above the player, then I figured that would be way too punishing, because players don't tend to look up. I guess that's why arrows don't do it either. Then I landed on the idea of disguising itself as dripstone, and falling on the player if they walk under. This would deal with much less damage, but still provide some excitement. We've only gotten two new cave biomes in this update, but each biome varies gameplay not just aesthetically, but mechanically. This is great, because I'd rather have quality over quantity. Plus, the cave variation compensates for the lack of biomes. I haven't really felt like the caves have been missing biomes, except for the deep dark of course. I hope that these new biomes inspire the community to come up with ones similar in quality. Unfortunately, cave with sand or cave with snow doesn't really cut it anymore. When you consider all the features that Caves and Cliffs has, as well as the context of the pandemic, it's no wonder the update had to be split. The new generation, mountains, terrain, caves and ores, changes the game in so many ways and allows for so many more possibilities. Though I wish Copper and Amethyst had more uses from the start, it's a lot easier to add things later on than change things, so if anything had to be given less development time, I'm glad it was those two. Mining wasn't diversified too much, but it will be a while before the current content gets stale enough for that to be necessary, especially with the two beautiful cave biomes we got, each with in-depth features. Caves and Cliffs wasn't simple, but it is definitely something special. So, what do you think of the update? Feel free to comment below. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a like, or become a YouTube member, like Yal and Alethris have. Next month's video will be about the features that were postponed past 1.19, such as bundles and archaeology, so subscribe and hit the bell if you want to catch that. Thanks for watching, and see you then!